Toyota's recent automobile recall. Live coverage? It seems like all decisions here on Toyota, especially when you deal with uh, safety issues, the decisions are made in Japan. And, and you mentioned in your testimony you sent uh, Mr. Strickland and others to Japan to talk to Toyota representatives, or I should say the head of Toyota, which just further emphasizes the point that everything's made in Japan. The problem's here in America. Why couldn't we have dealt here with it in the United States, or is it everything compartmentized that strict with this organization or company that the decisions have to be made in Japan and you had to go? I, I, I find that a little odd, that's all. You know, I care to respond to that. I plan to meet with Mr. Toyota, who will be in the United States this, uh, this week. He's agreed to meet with me. And, and one of the things I am going to stress to him is that they, they have some very good people in North America, some very good people. But perhaps they need to look at their business model. And what I mean by that is that when they're, they're good, experienced, qualified, professional people in North America make recommendations, they need to listen to them. Well, did your investigation show that when people uh, in our America made our, our a decision? people met with the North American people, but we decided to go directly to Japan. Why? Because they could not make a decision here in the United States? Because on, on we the felt decision? that uh, maybe the people in Japan were a little bit safety deaf. And we wanted, to, we wanted to give them an opportunity to hear directly from us that this is serious. And when I talked to Mr. Toyota, I said three things. The first thing I said is, this is a very serious matter for your company in America. I want you to know that DOT is taking it seriously, and we are not going to sleep until every one of your cars is safe for Americans to drive. And then I invited him to come to America. Well, I called you after those articles yes. appeared, and I, we never had a chance to talk, but I thought you did. You've been proactive in trying to get out in front of this. One of the concerns I have, and has come out, that 70 percent of this sudden unintended acceleration, we still don't have an answer for. And in fact, I think uh, according to all the documents from NHTSA and also from Toyota, their database, that's only 16 percent of these sudden accelerations are really addressed with the floor mat and this stuck sticky yellow uh, accelerator, if you will. Any, the electronics seems to have to have some part of it on this remaining 70 percent. Do we have any, are we any further? Yes, I mean, we're going to, as I said in my testimony, we are going to do a complete review of the electronics. We will meet with the folks from Southern Illinois University, take a look at the results of what they've had to, to look at. We'll look at what uh, the Toyota folks have done with the people that they've hired. Uh, we're going to get into this. We're going to get into the weeds on the electronics. We feel an obligation to do that because we get 30,000 complaints a year, and we take every one seriously. We don't just set them off to the side. We look at every one, and when we see a few start to stack up, then we really get into it. We are going to get into the weeds on the electronics. I, I commit to you we're going to do that. How about this event data recorder? That which records information five seconds before an accident, one after. Well, we're look, we, we have a review of that going on right now. But, but it says your NHTSA investigators have been at some of these accident sites, like the uh, South Lake, Texas one on January 12, 2010, they were there. The uh, one that happened up in uh, Auburn, New York, uh, that one was also NHTSA folks were there. In fact, it says investigators from NHTSA took the black box on November 27th. What, what did you do with the, what would your investigators do with the black box if you don't have any way to read it? Well, look, at we, we uh, our, our challenge is to investigate these, to look into them, and to, to render some judgment about it. And, uh, well, would, would your investigators have taken the black box from the... Uh, uh, you know what, Mr. Site? Chairman, I, I don't know the specifics okay. on that incident, but I'll, uh, I'll check it out and... Uh, well, I got that from your uh, outline that NHTSA provided us, all the actions you took. Okay. So, uh, so do, do you have any knowledge of them taking your investigators? I, I don't. Okay. Um, Dr. Gilbert, who testified earlier today, indicated that he was able to bypass the system and and the diagnostic code would not come up on air in a fail-safe system. It was 
a bookend, as we called it, uh, one of the things that could happen on this sudden acceleration. He said he notified NHTSA of the uh, test results, what he found, uh, tried to contact NHTSA, and all he got back was a form, an uh, uh, email form, saying thank you for contacting us. Uh, can you assure us that NHTSA is going to follow up with Dr. Gilbert? You have my 100 percent commitment that we will get in the weeds on this. We will talk to anybody that wants to talk to us. We will look at studies that have been conducted already, whether it's SIU or studies that have been done uh, through the Toyota program, and uh, we will figure this out. I, I know that all of you think this is a serious issue, and so we think it's a serious issue. Well, we know how serious you think it is because you had them stop building cars here in the United States, certain models. Is that, are they still building those cars? They've have still on a stop, pause? Well, what's the status on Toyota? On, on uh, what again? On building some of the cars, some of their models here in the United States. They stopped after your intervention. Have they started uh, producing those cars again? Uh, that I don't know. I'll have, to, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Does NHTSA need the responsibility? Uh, I should say, does NHTSA need to accept some of the responsibility? We heard from the Smiths today about how they felt that NHTSA just came out and tried to convince them as the floor mats. Is there some responsibility NHTSA shares here in this whole investigation? Well, I, I will go back to, if you look at my testimony, Mr. Chairman, no one has talked more about safety in Washington, D.C. and around the country than Ray LaHood since January 23rd, 09. We had 12 safety summits on regional jets. We had a day and a half distracted driving conference. We stepped up on a tarmac rule so that people don't have to sit on airlines more than three hours. We, we suspended air traffic controllers when there was a crash over the Hudson River between a helicopter and a small plane. And, and we also uh, investigated when the pilots overflew Minneapolis uh, by 150 miles. Look, we're not sitting around on our hands. Safety is our number one priority. We take it seriously. We take every complaint seriously. We look at it, and we, uh, we, we open investigations when we think it needs to be done. No one doubts your aggressive enforcement action. The problem we have up here, if we have all these complaints on sudden surges in this vehicle, Toyota vehicles, and we got 70 percent unresolved, how do we resolve that 70 percent that is still unaccounted for unexplained, and we have million of the millions of these vehicles on the road. Yeah, well, we, 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 will, uh, we will continue our investigations, which we have going on. There are, uh, you know, currently uh, investigations going on. There are recalls going on, many of them sparked by the Department of Transportation and NHTSA, initiated by us. But you can't continue the investigation as NHTSA have when 2004, when you did your report, your ODI, as you call it, March 23rd, 2004. You closed it on July 22nd, 2004. During that period of time, there were five fatal accidents involving surges. And basically, the NHTSA investigator said, it doesn't count because we're only looking for a momentary surge. Those surges or that accelerator that got stuck stayed on too long. So we just disregarded it. It was almost looked like they looked at it with blinders on. When we do this investigation and get that 70 percent, we can't do that. I, I, I am, for the love of me, because my past career I was an investigator, you're doing an investigation, you get five fatal accidents come in and you can't explain and people think the car went really fast and there might have been a surge acceleration and you don't take that into consideration in your report. That's just poor work. Well, that won't happen on my watch. Very good. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, welcome to our committee. Uh, my staffer is going to bring you uh, something to look at, but while she's doing that, I have been trying to get a, an unredacted report of the, uh, the NHTSA report on the Mark Saylor accident. And I realize that uh, the appropriate person to ask is the head of NHTSA, but we don't get to ask the head of NHTSA in this committee. I've got you, so I'm going to ask you, can my office have made available to it an unredacted NHTSA accident report on the uh, Mark Saylor accident. Uh, if it's legally possible for us to do it, absolutely. And I, I don't, you know, you can see my, my problem <clears throat> when I try to read the report. Paragraph 5 is blacked out. Now, 
perhaps that's something that is not pertinent to be in, in, the, in general circulation or open source, I'm willing to come down to your place and, and review it under, under armed guard if necessary, but it raises questions back home. I mean, I have people on the radio talking about why can no one see an unredacted report? And again, if it's something that relates to the accident that would be harmful to the family to have out in the general circulation, I understand that, but I would certainly, as a member of Congress who does have some clearance to look at things, I, I think that should be made available. Now, L let me just say, Mr. Burgess, what I will do is ask our general counsel uh, to uh, brief you on this, on what we can say and what we can't say, and uh, we'll try and do that uh, very quickly here. Well, as you know, the, once the information is denied to you, the fantasy can become more extreme than the reality, and it would just, it would be helpful to me to be, to, to know what's, uh, what's been redacted from that. On the, uh, on the issue of, uh, and I appreciate that you've only been there for one year, appreciate your comments about safety being top priority. Sari brought to you a, a graph showing the uh, um, uncommanded accelerations in the Camry vehicle, I believe, and I believe this is a NHTSA produced document, and clearly, uh, you know, without getting into great detail there, this was, there was a change about 2001 or 2002 where the number of incidents were very low and then suddenly it goes high and stays high. My understanding from Mr. Lentz's testimony is that coincided with the, the time that the electronic throttle control became uh, marketed on those automobiles. And I would just ask the question, you know, what should the should there have not been some curiosity at some point as to why this is happening now at a level previously unprecedented? What has changed in the manufacturing? Sure, the electronic throttle control is one thing. Were there other things that changed in the manufacturing? Uh, if safety is going to be job one, it can't take us that long to investigate these things, and it certainly can't take a very dramatic and tragic accident to, to spark the in investigation. So the only point I would make from that, again, and it's a produced document, and I realize that there is, uh, the personnel does change from time to time, uh, but we have to keep that, uh, obviously that has, to be, uh, that has to be foremost in our minds. Now, from the NHTSA documents that we have, it looks like they've received 113 vehicle owner questionnaires alleging sudden and intended acceleration related to th the throttle. Um, the Office of Defect Investigations believes that only 14 of those questionnaires were relevant to the throttle control. So how does that office narrow that number down? How are, how are cases included or excluded uh, where only about 10% of the cases that were brought to NHTSA's attention were, were actually thought to be uh, an uncommanded accelerator? By looking at the uh, documents, by interviewing people, by talking to people, and then by making a judgment about whether it's something that uh, has validity or standing, in light of some of the things that we've heard uh, in our testimony today, should we go back and look at those other nine out of ten that uh, were deemed not to be, not to, to represent true uncommanded accelerations? Um, perhaps they, perhaps they deserve a, a, a closer look or closer scrutiny. Well, I take your point on that, and I go back to what I said to uh, Chairman Stupak that we are going to really get in the weeds on the electronics and uh, I, I assume that we'll be looking, take a look back at some of those. On, uh, I guess just very recently within the last day or two, your Inspector General from the Department of Transportation announced uh, an audit initiated on NHTSA's Office of Defect Investigations. Um, the audit's going to build on earlier works concerning implementation of the Tran Act, this specific undertaking is going to focus on recent actions taken by the agency regarding the Toyota recalls. Um, obviously, this is something you felt was necessary to do. Well, look, at the inspector general does his own thing. He's an independent operator. He doesn't take his cues from me. He decided to do this, I think, either at the request of Congress or because his people thought it was something to do. He doesn't consult with me on these things. He lets me know, but he doesn't consult to see if I agree with him or not. Has he let you know the, the, the scope of the investigation, what it will include? He has. And can you share that with us? Pardon me? Can you share the, the scope of the investigation? Uh, I think it's up on our website. I think he posted it on his website, which would be our website. I, I think it's up. 
and when that report becomes available, you will you will obviously make it available. He'll make it available. As soon as his report is complete, he puts it up on his website. Now, from everything we've heard today on, uh, on the issue surrounding the Toyota and uncommanded acceleration, um, it gives people the impression that there's a lot of problems with this product. But if you actually list things down, the number of problems per vehicle mile driven or for percent of market share, I guess, is a more appropriate uh, measurement. Toyota's not really high on that list, are they? In terms of? The number of incidents per, per percentage of market share. I mean, a NHTSA document that is, that is available actually ranks Toyota number 17. There are 16 other automobiles that have more problems per percentage of market. Well, I mean, if you look at the complaints, the 30,000 complaints we receive, and you look at the investigations we do, and then you look at the recalls, uh, the vast majority of them are, are not with Toyota. They're with other, other brand of uh, automobiles. But we're talking today about an, in, an increased level of scrutiny because of perhaps some of the uncommanded accelerations were missed in earlier investigations. I guess the only question is, are you going to go back and look at some of those other vehicle manufacturers that are, that are higher in the list for these types of incidents? Yes. And have you already initiated that? Uh, we're just, as I said, we're just starting uh, our, uh, our review and our, our, our look back. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, when, those, when, when that data becomes available, again, we'd appreciate you sharing it with this Thank committee. you. We will. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Chairman Waxman, please, for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary LaHood, our review shows that you had 2,600 complaints concerning this sudden unintended acceleration, but the NHTSA only looked at the electronic systems one time, and that was in 2004. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, do you think that the 2004 investigation was sufficient? I, I think that under our watch, uh, we are going to get into the weeds and we're going to have a complete review on the electronics. Uh, but looking back from here, there was only one review and that was in 2004. Would you say that was sufficient? I know no. you're planning to do no. more. No. The answer is no. Okay. We've looked at the record and the 2004 investigation was not comprehensive or in-depth. It was headed by an individual who, in an email to Toyota officials, said that he was not very knowledgeable about electronic throttle systems. It excluded the vast majority of complaints involving sudden unintended acceleration, including the most dangerous types, high-speed events in which the brakes are unable to stop the vehicle. It appears that NHTSA never independently evaluated Toyota's claim about the adequacy of its systems. And there's no evidence that NHTSA did its own testing of electronic throttle control systems. Your staff told us that you had no electrical engineer on staff to help you assess the problem, and they never hired an outside electrical engineer. Now, I know you weren't around then, so I don't blame you, but I am concerned that uh, I haven't heard you express any disagreements with any decisions made at the agency before your time. Am I, am I stating that incorrectly? Do you feel the agency has done what it should have done prior well, to your being there? What I've tried to do is be forward-looking, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've spent the last year talking about safety. I've traveled the country. I've been to 35 states and 80 cities, and everywhere I go, I talk about safety, whether it's car safety, airplane safety, train safety. Uh, the, the train crash in California was caused by a distracted train driver. And that's why we decided to take on that cause. And we will continue to do that. Uh, Mr. Look Secretary, at, I, I, look at, I, look I, I applaud you. Pardon me? I applaud you for your efforts and what you've told us of, about how uh, high a priority safety is. And, I, and I'm pleased uh, that you're going to uh, take that position and try to steer the Department of Agency, uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Agency, under your watch to do the kind of job uh, that needs to be done. I think that uh, part of it is leadership, but I think there needs to be a fundamental reform at NHTSA. Uh, some of that you can do administratively and some may require legislation. We'll be here to help you. We want this agency, as you want, uh, to do the job of protecting the safety of the American people. I, I must say, as I look at the record, it's not a happy one. It's not a successful one, and it's not the one that you and, you and I 
uh, want from that agency. Let's both look forward and make the changes uh, to assure the American people that uh, the situation is going to be different in the future. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would say this. I don't know of another member of Congress while I was serving or since I've left that has been more concerned about these issues than you have. And I, I, we really appreciate your support on this. We may be coming to you and asking for some legislative remedies, and I know you'll be there for us. And uh, we, that may be happening sooner rather than later. And if you have legislative remedies, we want to work with you on this. Well, Mr. Rush is the chairman of the subcommittee with the legislative jurisdiction, and we're going to work with him and with you uh, to uh, do what we need to do in terms of the, of the law to give you the powers and give that agency the powers uh, to do what needs to be done. And I know you're determined to accomplish that goal, so I look forward to uh, Thank you. Uh, working with you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Dingell, for questions, please. Friend, Mr. LaHood, back. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Thank you, Mr. sir. Around here. Uh, Mr. Secretary, yes or no? To your knowledge, has Toyota completed, complied with its statutory and regulatory obligations, whether mandated under the Tread Act or otherwise, in conducting its 2009 and 2010 recalls related to sudden unintended acceleration? Uh, I'd, I'd rather get back to you on the record, if I could, sir. All right. Uh, if you will submit us a proper response at a time later. Mr. Secretary. If Toyota has not complied with its statutory and regulatory obligations related to these recalls, uh, will you please submit for the record a description of how and what punitive action the Department of Transportation has, result, has taken as a result of this noncompliance? Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Secretary, uh, since 2001, how many reports of sudden unintended acceleration has the Department of Transportation received from Toyota Motor Sales USA, Inc. Would you please submit a list and a description of each and every one of these reports for the record? Yes, sir. Have you, do you know whether you have received all of these or not? Uh, I, I'll submit that for the record. All right. Mr. Secretary, again, yes or no? Are the Secretary of Transportation and NHTSA Administrator empowered under statute to visit foreign automakers in their home countries? Yes. Now, Mr. Secretary, yes or no? Have Secretaries of Transportation and NHTSA Administrators done so in the past? Yes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, would you describe such visits to the headquarters of foreign automakers as routine or commonplace? Uh, commonplace. Commonplace? Well, I mean, we, we try and make visits. Uh, we do. We try and do it on a regular, our NETSA folks try and do it on a regular basis, yes. All right. Is there anything extraordinary here about you having the administrator or the acting administrator go over there um, while this investigation is going on? Yes. I mean, and, we, that was, was a special trip. Was that was not a routine trip. That was a special trip. Special trip. Why, why was this a special trip that you and the administrator made? We wanted to get their attention and tell them we're taking these safety issues seriously and they need to take them seriously. And immediately upon return of our NHTSA acting administrator, they really stepped up and I think took our word on this. Why did you have to do this, Mr. Secretary? Well, I... I think they were a little safety were, were deaf. They, were they complying in a way that... I think they were a little safety deaf. Pardon? I think that they were a little safety deaf, and we wanted to create some hearing devices for them, so we took a big megaphone with us, and we got their attention. So you're, you're, you're telling me that you felt it necessary to do this because of the safety of the American driving public. Is that right? That's correct. Have you had to do that before? Not with Toyota. Uh, with anybody else? Not that I know of. So this is this is essentially unique. You, you I'll check. I'll get, I'll make sure I get that accurate for the record. But I'm not aware of it. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Secretary, are the reporting requirements for early warning of possible vehicle safety defects different in Japan than in the United States? I'll I'll get back to you on on the record. You, for that. On the record. Very well, Mr. Secretary. 
Are the Japanese requirements in this regard more or less stringent than American requirements? Yeah, I'll let you know. All right, I assume that will be for the On the record, yes, sir. Now, Mr. Secretary, uh, if the Japanese requirements are less stringent, is it your experience that this affects the manner in which Toyota evaluates potential defects in its vehicles and influence what the information, uh, rather what information the company provides to U.S. regulators? I'll put that on the record, sir. Very well. Now, Mr. Secretary, um, you, um, I don't know whether you heard the testimony of Mr. Lentz. I did. I found, I found myself concerned. He said that the decisions on these questions had to be made in Tokyo and that he couldn't do these decisions. Uh, was that the reason you had to go to Mexico or go to uh, uh, Tokyo to talk to the Japanese or rather talk to Toyota? Yes. About the safety question? Yes, sir. Because that was where the decisions was made. That's correct. Now, is this a problem to you that, that, that you don't deal with, with uh, Toyota the way you have to deal with other automobile makers? I told Chairman Stupak earlier that I think their business model for making decisions needs some adjustments. Well, but it, the adjustment has to be because of, of your problems in dealing with it. And so instead of getting the decision made here in the United States, you've got to try it over there to Tokyo to have the decision made. That, that doesn't seem to me that we're enforcing, the, that we're able to enforce the law speedily, expeditiously, and efficiently as, as is necessary for the safety of the American driving public. Is that right? I also told the chairman that I'm going to be meeting with Mr. Toyota when he's here in America, and I hope uh, to talk with him about some of these issues. Okay. Now, I've, uh, the governors of four states sent a letter that I find most distressing because if this government is, 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 is going to use uh, ownership in automobiles to confer benefits or disadvantage on anybody, I want to know about it. Is, is there any truth in the assumption that these governors are making that in some way or other there's politics or ownership of... Uh, the, of General Motors and Chrysler is in any way related to the actions that are now being taken by uh, uh, your department against Toyota? I've talked to three of those four governors, and I told them that that letter uh, was not accurate. Our investigation of any car company is not based on who they are. Uh, the idea that we would not take seriously complaints from people who drive Toyotas, belies belief, and the idea that we would do it because our government owns 60% of GM is baloney. And I told three of the four governors that. You might tell the fourth. I think he could use it. Well, I, I, I will. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, uh, you are familiar with uh, event data recorders? Uh, I believe these are useful to NHA, NHTSA, are they not? Yes. Have you, in, have you looked at all the EDRs in the Toyota vehicles that have been recalled? Well, we have not, but we, again, are going to uh, relook at that. Some of them do not carry these kinds of recorders. Are you able to easily read the recorders of uh, the Toyota vehicles? Or do you have some difficulty? Yeah, what, what I'd like to do is, is really look at the statistics on that and, and put, get back to you on the record for um, ones that we could read and ones we had difficulty with. Very well. Mr. Chairman, you've been very gracious. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's good to have Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rush, for questions, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you here. Uh, and it's good that uh, you're testimony so far has been, uh, uh, has been an excellent testimony and uh, even uh, so, to a certain extent inspiring considering your uh, hands on the problem and your hands on approach and your dedication and commitment. I know you uh, as a member of this house and I know that you're a very capable and forthright individual and you say what you mean and you mean what you say. Um, and I am also uh, encouraged by the, uh, I think it's the um, confirmation of uh, Mr. S David Strickland as the head of NHTSA. Uh, but that said, I uh, do have 
some concerns and I have some questions that I want to ask you. First of all, earlier today, I want to get this out of the way. I received an email from uh, one of my staff members who uh, uh, sent, who received an email in kind from uh, one of the uh, executives at the Chicago Defender. You are aware of that newspaper, the Chicago Defender. And they indicated that, uh, this person indicated that his sister-in-law had been killed on December the 28th uh, in a Toyota Avalon somewhere near Dallas, Texas. And there were three individuals in the car uh, and uh, all four of them were killed. Uh, the car flipped over and rested in a pond. Um, and the police, uh, according to him, said that this had nothing. This was uh, that this wasn't a result of a breaking issue. So it, it means that something was wrong uh, electronically for my if it wasn't a breaking issue. So my question and my request is that you look into that. I will get you all the pertinent information that I have and that I can gather and get you that. And I we, will, I uh, we will look at it. We'll get the information from you and we'll look at it. Okay, that's it. Um, Toyota consumers have witnessed a significant decline in their resale values. Um, and that means that there is a possibility and a probability uh, that um, Toyota consumers, the owners of these vehicles, will uh, experience a sharp increase in their insurance premiums uh, for owning these vehicles. Are you concerned about that? Uh, no. I, I haven't heard about that, no. Uh, well, if, in fact, that does become a reality, and especially in this time of economic hardship, I think that we could be uh, proactive in trying to uh, uh, offset that in some kind of way. Okay. Right. Uh, the members of this committee have raised several areas of concern with regard to NHTSA's response to uh, certain uh, unintended acceleration and that could be re uh, explained by resource constraints within the agency. And as the chairman said, you know, the committee that I, subcommittee that I chair will begin to hear and begin to uh, become very active on this reauthorization. NHTSA's budget for operations and research has been stagnant for the last 10 years. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes. Uh, and as cars become more reliant on computers to operate, NHTSA has not kept up and doesn't have sufficient expertise in electronics to judge the safety of new electronic uh, automobile uh, technology. On at least five occasions, NHTSA's Office of Defects Investigation cited resource, resource constraints as a reason for denying a, a, de a defect petition filed by an individual who experienced sudden unintended acceleration. The question is, does NHTSA have the resources it needs to meet the challenges of its mission? Well, I, I, I hope that you all uh, will be pleased to hear uh, that in President Obama's budget for the Department of Transportation, there will be 66 new positions at NHTSA. That's what the president is proposing. We have 125 engineers, and some of them are electrical engineers. The idea that we don't have the experts to do the work is not quite accurate. We do have electrical engineers. We have 125 engineers. And the president has requested in his budget request to all of you 66 new positions at NHTSA. Well, again. No, we're, gonna, we're moving away from stagnation. Well, I, I believe in you uh, as a secretary, and I believe in Mr. Strickland. And so we will be working hand in hand with you to make sure. Yes, I look and forward the, to that. And the reauthorization, uh, that we move uh, NHTSA forward and that we address these problems. I, I, I can't, you've only been there a year, but I, I'm really mindful and, and uh, something that's repulsive to me is for departments and employees uh, uh, of these departments and departments themselves having uh, regulatory romance with these uh, uh, agency or these uh, manufacturers and, and these businesses and corporations that they have to oversee. And I hope that you will build a firewall 
uh, 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 that's clear uh, and direct that there can be no regulatory romance between uh, the uh, agencies that you uh, have to oversee. I look forward to working with you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you're back. Mr. Secretary, just one thing. Your staff told us you have no electrical engineers at NHTSA. Have what? You, I'm sorry. You have no electrical engineers. We have electrical engineers. At NHTSA? Yes, sir. Well, it's contrary to the, what they've told this committee and committee staff during the investigation. They said they have engineers who have taken some classes. but We not. have 125 engineers and we have electrical engineers as a part of the 125. I'm sworn to tell the truth here, Mr. Chairman. I, I know, and that's why I'm wanting, I wouldn't be I lying about engineers. I'll tell you that. If I'm going to lie about something, it's not going to be about engineers. Are, are any of these electrical engineers in the Office of Defect Investigations in? They, they work for NHTSA, and their right. responsibility are to use their expertise in this area. So ODI, Office of Defect Investigation, can tap other parts of NHTSA. That that's correct. They, we use their expertise for this. Well, that's amazing. The staff didn't know you had all that expertise a week ago. Uh, Mr. Markey, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, and welcome back, Ray. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you for your work at the thank you. transportation. Um, you know, the impression that uh, I think we've all been left with here today is that uh, Toyota was aggregating all this information in Tokyo, but they weren't sharing it with, uh, uh, with uh, their dealers, their employees, uh, the people that ran different countries, okay? And, uh, and so we're, we're at an uh, inflection point here where obviously we have to change the system, we have to give you more power, uh, and uh, we have to just make sure that this does not occur in the future. So I'd just like to walk through a few things and maybe get your response to that. Okay. Because I think it will help us to flesh out the, the authorities you'll need and the, and the things that um, we have to put in place to make sure we don't see a recurrence. So it turns out that Toyota recalled a Lexus in the UK in 2000 because of a floor mat problem that was identical to that involved in the more recent recalls here in the United States. It's my understanding that the Department of Transportation uh, was never informed of that recall. In 2003, the department turned down a consumer protection a petition filed by an individual from Braintree, Massachusetts, alleging sudden acceleration problems involving his 99 Lexus, saying the department had no reason to think there were excessive problems with Lexus based on what it knew at the time. It wasn't getting the information from Toyota. So, you know, it was not in a situation to see the entire uh, situation. Um, do you think the department might have reached a different conclusion had it known about the 2000 UK Lexus recall involving, involving the floor mats and trapping uh, accelerator pedals? Well, I'd only be venturing a guess, uh, Mr. Markey. I, I would assume that we would have, but um, that's a guess. Uh, the law doesn't require automakers to report on foreign safety problems that it might have had that do not result uh, in an actual recall, but we've learned recently that one of Toyota's tactics when dealing with safety regulators is to use lobbyists uh, to try to limit the scope of recalls or to prevent them from occurring at all. Um, do you think that requiring automa automakers to more broadly report safety problems uh, that they have encountered in other countries could help you do your job? Yes. Uh, during today's hearing, Toyota claimed to be just beginning to examine the possibility that there are problems with its uh, vehicle's electronics, while an outside academic said he proved that real-world circumstances existed under which the software that is supposed to automatically turn cars off if the throttle electronics fail does not work. Uh, we've also learned that Toyota had evidently validated that result. Uh, do you think it would, uh, it would be inaccurate to assert that Toyota has identified and proposed remedies for all of the sudden acceleration problems that have been documented for its vehicles? Well, look, at, we're, we're going to uh, do a complete, comprehensive, down-in-the-weeds review of the electronics. We'll take information that was presented to your committee today. 
We'll look at all the data. We'll look at all the information. We will not rest until we fi finally find out if electronics are a part of this problem. Can I, can I ask, do you think that you need expanded authority to enable you to more easily conduct mandatory recalls? Do you need more authority? No, sir. Really? Not really. No, I mean, we do these investigations. We meet with uh, auto companies. And uh, if they're not willing to do the recall voluntarily, we have the authority to do it. Okay. Um, and, uh, but you need the information. We, we have to have the information. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we've missed the target on the electronics, we will correct that. We're going to do that. We're going to have a complete review. Um, the early warning database um, that uh, consists of reports provided by auto manufacturers to the department, and these reports are generally kept secret unless the department opens up uh, an investigation. Um, what do you think about the public in terms of them providing, being provided with more information regarding potential safety defects that automakers tell the department about even before an investigation is opened or a recall is announced? We're for transparency. The more information we can give the public, the better. Uh -huh. and do you need authority to do that? Do we have to change any? I'll, I'll have to. I'll, I'll look. I, I don't know for sure, Mr. Markey. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. That would be helpful because we want to be as helpful. Of course. We want to be as helpful to you as we can be. We think that, you know, you're clearly, uh, in my opinion, a great Secretary of Transportation. So Thank you. We want to work with you to Thank you. Uh, accomplish, you know, I appreciate that. while you're Thank you. at the agency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I missed the get for questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'll add my welcome, Mr. Thank Secretary, you. And, and associate myself with Mr. Markey's last remarks, maybe not his first, no, I'm, uh, all of his remarks. Um, I, I just have a couple questions for you. The first one, um, I, I think I know the answer to this. The New York Times has reported that NHTSA officials were frustrated with Toyota's slow response while conducting its investigation into acceleration issues. From your previous testimony today, I would assume that you agree with that assessment that sl Toyota was often slow to re respond to requests from your agency as far as you know. Yes, I mean we we've had we've had issues with them, and that's the reason that Ron Metford, our acting, then acting uh, NITS administrator, went to Japan. Ron came to me and said, "Look, it, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think they're listening to us. I need to go to Japan." And I said, "Leave tonight." Yeah, and when was that? Uh, it was late last year. Yeah, and the, and and from from your sense from talking to Ron and others in the agency, was this a a pattern um, with with Toyota even before? Uh, uh, the new what administration I, yeah, and payment. what I said earlier is uh, Toyota has some very good people in North America, sure. very professional people. They know what they're doing. But I'm not sure that they were able to really communicate that to the folks in, in Tokyo. And that's the reason Ron felt he had to go there. I, I'm not going to trash the people in North America at Toyota. They're good people. They're professional people. And I told Mr. Toyota when I talked to him, I said, safety is number one. You need to take this seriously. And, and I encouraged him to, to really do that. And I, I think they've gotten that message. Yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear that you gave him that message. And, and um, you know, NHTSA, had, NHTSA conducted six investigations into Toyota safety problems since 2003. So this didn't just start last year. This was ongoing right. since 2003. So my question is, do you know why, um, since, these, since these frustrations were happening at the agency since 2003, that NHTSA didn't use its subpoena power once in all those years of investigation? Well, we have other authority other than subpoena power, and we've used it from time to time. We have other enforcement mechanisms. But, you know, as I said at the top in my testimony, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be forward-looking here. Sure. I've been in this job a little over a year. If you want me to go back and account for what oh, happened in, in 04, I'll do that. No, but. no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> but, what, but what I do want to ask you, so number one, you don't know why they didn't do that before. I, I don't personally know, but I could find out. And number two... Do you reserve the right to use the subpoena power going forward if you don't get adequate response? Absolutely. Totally. Great. Um, my, my second and last question is, 
Following up on the questions Mr. Rush was and, and also Mr. Stupak were asking about the NHTSA budget is um, you said that that there are 66 new positions in the administration's budget Correct. within NHTSA. But at the same time, NHTSA's fiscal year 2011 budget for the vehicle operations and research side of the agency is about even. So we're wondering where you're going to fund those extra positions and will they be able to work in this particular uh, part of the agency? Look, if, if the Congress approves our budget with additional staff, we will take those resources and put them where they're needed. Okay, so you think, you think that you'll be able to hire these 66 new positions within that flat budget? I think we'll be able to use, if, if we get 66 new positions and you provide the money for it, we'll take those people and put them where they're needed. If they're needed on looking into electronics, we'll do that. If they're needed in other areas, we'll do that. We're okay, gonna... but, so, but so your view is that the 66 new people aren't necessarily looking into electronics. They're just... They're going to be, a, they're gonna be a human resource that we're going to use where we need them. Where the problems are. Okay, so when you when so let's say you do need them in electronics because it seems like from past years again, not speaking about the last year when you've been secretary, but from past years, this has been a deficiency in the agency. If you put them over there, where where are you going to take it from in the agency's current enforcement? Well, I don't know the specifics on that, but and I'd be happy to get back to you. Um, We'll keep our fingers crossed that you provide us the additional 66. See, see, I'll just, I'll just tell you, Mr. Secretary, what we're concerned about, not just with NHTSA, but a lot of the other consumer agencies, is over the last eight to 10 years, these agencies have been starved of resources. And we're concerned that if you take 66 new positions, which might be authorized, but if there's no additional funding for the agency that we're going to stint on other places where we're, all, we're, all, where we're already short on enforcement. Yeah, no, look, at, I would assume if we get the authorization, we're going to get the money to pay for them. I mean, that, that would be our goal. Okay, so that, and that would be in addition to your fiscal 2011 budget? Our 2011 budget would be the 66 additional people plus the money to pay for them. Okay. Because the request we know about is pretty much flat. Uh, I, our goal will be to. Your, our goal your will be. Have some advice. Yeah, let me just see what it says here. Yeah, um, it says increase in salary count. Look at, if we if you authorize 66, I'll, I'll work with our friends on the appropriations committee to find the money. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Christensen, for questions, please. Thank you, um, and welcome, Secretary. Thank you. It's always good to have you here, and having worked with you for quite a few years, and um, knowing your integrity, having witnessed your commitment and passion for safety, um, I have confidence that what needs to be done at NHTSA will, will get done. I probably, some of the questions about what authorities you need have already been asked, and um, so let me just ask this one, one question. After the Firestone Ford Explorer rollover problem, I read that Congress in, uh, introduced and passed a TREAD Act, which required NHTSA to create an early warning system to gather and analyze more information on auto safety to eliminate defects sooner. In a 2004 report, and I realize this is before you came, but in that report from the Department of Transportation, um, Inspector General, it was stated that the cost estimates for the project were way above what had been anticipated and that the computer system that existed at that time did not have the advanced analytical capabilities that were envisioned by the law. So it didn't have the money, but they didn't have the capability of creating that early, having that early warning system to gather and analyze the information. Do you know if that problem has been corrected since the Inspector General reported that in 2004? It has been, and I can tell you this. I mean, when we got into this uh, Toyota thing, I, I, I've been going over this and going over this. I think we have some outstanding people. Uh, they work very hard. We get 30,000 complaints a year. We look at what other uh, organizations are saying and doing. We talk to car companies. And we take everyone seriously. We don't set any aside. 
And when we really see a, a curve and see something that really catches us, we begin to look at that very carefully. And so I think we have a good system in place. Uh, hopefully we get a few more resources in terms of people. But I think the system works very well. If somebody has a complaint, we take it seriously. If it's an individual driver or, or a, a company or an organization, and uh, we, we just, we, and, and our people look at every one. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I yield back at time. Thank you. Ms. Sutton for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, you. for being here and uh, for your work um, at the department. Uh, a couple of, of, of things. The, the black boxes that we've heard about, um, I'm just trying to get clarification on that. Does NHTSA have access to the data that was contained in black boxes that might, you know, might have been, um, might be in, in uh, Tokyo? I mean, as I understand it, Toyota has access to this information, but can we access it? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Does, do any of you know the answer to that? They have only one tool that can do it for three DRs in the country. It's very difficult to get to the definition. Okay, so it's very difficult for us. They only have one reader to read these devices, and it's very difficult to get the information. Okay, so finding ways to get information that is relevant to us enforcing safety, uh, you know, concerns here is, is something that we should be looking it at. It is. And I do think that all of this has been a big wake-up call for Toyota. I think you'll find that when Mr. Toyota comes on Capitol Hill tomorrow, when he makes some visits to some folks. I mean, I, I think they, they get it now. Uh, they, they need to be more attuned and sensitive to these things. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, and also, just uh, because we have the opportunity to make sure the record's clear here on certain things, um, I reviewed the, uh, the report issued by NHTSA on the CARS program. Um, was happy to see that positive jobs impact of at least 60,000 jobs. Um, but I also want to make sure that people understand, because I think there's been some effort to confuse the record about uh, the way that we've talked a lot about resources and what you need to do to accomplish the safety functions that uh, fall within NHTSA's responsibility. And we want to make sure that you always have uh, what you need. And if you need more than you have now, we want to make sure you've got it. But just to clarify, uh, it's my understanding that at NHTSA, I mean, which also, of course, has responsibility over fuel economy standards, which is why cash for clunkers was also part of NHTSA's uh, purview, um, that the people who deal with fuel economy and the people who deal with the safety functions under NHTSA are two different sets of people. Is that correct? It is correct. But I, I will say this, uh, Congresswoman, and, and you know this, in the first four days of that program, which was uh, your stepchild or child or however you want to characterize it, it was your idea. It was ours. Um, 250,000 cars were sold. Yeah. It was a wildly popular program. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you we weren't overwhelmed. Yeah. When you sell 250,000 cars and try and get the money out the door to dealers, it became a very serious issue for us. Mm -hmm. And we, we were trying to incorporate a lot of resources, including our FAA friends out in Oklahoma City who do a lot of good work, but they also know how to process paper. We use their expertise. We hired people from the outside to come in. But I, I want people to know there never for one instant was safety ever compromised as a result of the CARS program. Not for one second. I wouldn't let that happen. And, and Mr. Uh, uh, Secretary, the, the other issue, of course, is that I wouldn't let that happen either. And the reality is that we, um, we put $50 million in administrative costs into the legislation right. so that we actually gave resources that's when correct. When we gave work. That's correct. To NHTSA. That's and correct. And that, uh, that is an extraordinarily, I think, important point it is. not to be lost um, because it's easily swept uh, under the, the rug by, by those who might want to discredit what was clearly, as you point out, um, wildly popular. It was a lifeline to the automobile industry. Uh, no, no, no one could have ever sold seven or 800,000 cars in less than 30 days. It was a lifeline to car salesmen, to car dealers, to the loan companies, to the credit unions that made the loans, to the local governments that got the sales tax. The spinoff on that was incredible. It was a lot more 
than $3 billion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate, appreciate that clarification. Thank you. General Lady yields back. Ms. Shikowsky, Shikowsky, excuse me, Shikowsky for questions, please. Hi, Ray. Thank you for, uh, for, for being here and answering uh, all our questions. Thank you. And waiting to, being here at this late, late hour. L let me just tell you, I've been, I've been meeting, as I think other members have, with some of the Toyota dealers today who, uh, this couldn't have happened at a worse time in many ways with the downturn in the uh, uh, economy and they're very worried about um, their futures and we have to be too because there's a lot of jobs involved in dealerships and the manufacture of cars. They said that their sale of Toyotas is down like 50 percent right now, which is understandable. But one of the other things that they feel is that there's been disproportionate focus on this particular situation of Toyota. And they pointed out that there have been over the last year some oh, 143 or something like that recalls, some related to um, safety of other automobile manufacturers. So what, what I wanted to, to ask you is how would you rate Toyota's performance in dealing with Nissan safety issues compared to other automakers? Do we have a particular problem here? The vast majority of recalls are not, not on Toyotas. They're on other car that's manufacturers. What I'm saying, and that's what they were saying. That no, it is. And, uh, you know, we, we put, people know what that is. It, we, we put it out there. We're not trying to hide that. Uh, no, they weren't blaming. No, they were no. Just and saying and, that and the reason that people are focusing on this now is because of the horrific accident that occurred in San Diego where these people were uh, lost their lives. And, uh, and that really highlighted uh, the unfortunate circumstances by which that happened. And you all want to get to the bottom of it, and so do we. And, and I know there are people on this committee all day that have been talking about the electronics. We're going to get in the weeds on that. We feel an obligation to do that. If we've overlooked it, it won't, I guarantee you, it won't happen on my watch. We're, we're going we're to look into it. But, um, you know, the idea that we're picking on Toyota is just not accurate. I mean, look at, look at the statistics. Uh, over the last three years, 23 million recalls of automobiles as a result of our investigations. I, and I, the vast majority were not Toyota. Right. I think they were um, actually mostly just worried about the publicity that had been, been around this. Um, uh, look at Congresswoman. If you and I were in charge of publicity, there would be a lot of different stories written about everything. This is true. I would agree. I said, you know, some of us have the same problems. Um, one of the things that Toyota is doing is installing um, in some of the recalled cars, not all the models, a software fix that makes sure that the, the brakes override the accelerator. This seems like a, a really good idea. Is there some way that this could be required as a standard safety feature? Well, I heard Mr. Cars? Lentz say that they were doing it in the majority of their models as he was sitting here today, and we had not heard that before, and it's something that I think we really should look into. If that's a way to override an electrical problem or a sticky pedal or a a floor mat pedal that someone hasn't taken care of. I, look at I, any way that we can save lives and save injuries and correct something that's wrong, I, I think we should look at it. It seems to me that that would make a whole lot of sense now in this uh, computer and electronic era to yes. be sure that the brakes are yes. right. Yeah. I have no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes questions by members of the subcommittee. We still have members from the full committee here. Mr. Shimkus, did you have any questions? Of uh, no, no questions, just a statement, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Sure. First of all, Dr. Gilbert comes out of SIU Carbondale. He's a proud Saluki. Um, I got to listen to most of his testimony in the office, and I got to spend some time with him this afternoon. And so I just want to place on the record, very proud of him and for the work he's done. And, and I know my good friend and, and, and now former colleague, uh, Secretary LaHood, uh, would appreciate the Illinois connections of that. And I just want to, uh, on the record, you know, raise a good friend and a mentor of mine. And as you know, I've been a little combative um, in my three years, uh, last three years especially, and I think some of that style I learned from uh, 
the sitting secretary as he, uh, there's something to be said about telling it straight and forcefully and that's always been Ray's style and I appreciate it and on the record I appreciate your friendship and support over the years and I know you're working in the best interest of the country so thank you for what you do. Thank you for those uh, very good words, kind words and we are going to look at the, his research. We're going to look at everything and his testimony today but we want to look at the documents and see what he's done. Right. It, hopefully it'll be helpful to us. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez, questions please. Thank you very much. And the first thing, Mr. Chairman, could I ask unanimous consent that we all agree with Mr. Shimka's description of himself, that he is combative. Uh, but <laughs> Mr. Secretary, I've said it before, I'm saying it again. We miss you. Thank We'd you. I'd rather have you there on the floor Thank going you. to vote with us, Thank to be you. honest with you. It's great a job as you're doing. And too bad we don't have two of you. Uh, a couple of things. One, I think you said there were 250,000 cars sold on cash for clunkers. I think that may have been the first few days. I That's right. Sure. There was first like 750,000 cars sold. And I know I had some of my dealers complaining that the money wasn't being paid quick right. enough. The alternative uh, would be for the cars to remain on their lots. And when I reminded them of that, they were happy to wait a couple yes. of days. Uh, let me start off with a couple of observations. First of all, <clears throat> in your testimony, written testimony, I'm, I'm going to read from it. NHTSA does not contend that the two recalls will fully resolve all concerns about unintended acceleration in Toyota vehicles. However, with one exception, NHTSA has not been able to establish a vehicle-based cause for unintended acceleration events in, in Toyota vehicles not covered by those two recalls. The exception was a recall of the model year 2004 Sienna vans in 2009 due to a defective trim panel. Some consumers and others believe that Toyota's electronic throttle control ETC systems and perhaps such systems in other manufacturers' vehicles are susceptible to electromagnetic interference, EMI, that can theoretically cause unintended acceleration by resulting in incorrect signals to the engine. To be absolutely sure that the agency is aware of all potential defects, NHTSA is conducting a review of the general subject of possible EMI effects on ETC systems. Now, you've assured us that that is ongoing and you're going to be very aggressive about it, which we would all stand here and tell you how can we help you with it. The problem was, and we've had members make reference to it, was that members of NHTSA were here uh, and this is from a letter, actually, it's a body of a letter that has been forwarded to you, but it's dated February 22nd, so I doubt you've even had a chance to look at it. As the agency responsible for ensuring that the vehicles on the road are safe, it is essential that NHTSA have ample expertise to test and analyze electronic systems and to evaluate the sufficiency of tests and, and the analysis of the automobile and automaker's performance. It appears, however, that NHTSA lacks its expertise, hampering the ability of its Office of Defects investigation, ODI, to examine possible electronic defects in vehicles. In the briefing on February 18th, NHTSA officials told the committee staff that the agency has no electrical engineers or software engineers on staff. Now, that is not accurate. Is that correct? We have, we have uh, two electrical engineers. All right. We have 125 engineers. We have two electrical engineers, and we're about ready to hire another one. And the third thing I would say, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, is that when we need outside expertise, we use it. We do. I mean, we're not bashful about doing it. Uh, be, I mean, if we don't feel we have the, the expertise, we'll, we'll go out and find it. And I think that's an important point, and the reason for that, we've been talking about maybe expanding your authority, and I don't think you're going to be bashful about coming here and saying, legislatively speaking, you need a fix. But we also want to be very receptive to the expanded resources that you may require. And there's not going to be anybody on either side of this aisle right. that's not going to give you whatever you need to the, get to the bottom of this. It is good to see you here and to receive the assurance that you're aggressively pursuing this. I will end with one question. Is Toyota cooperating with your department? A hundred percent now. Thank you very much. I yield back. 100% now, they weren't always cooperating with you? Uh, I don't know that we would have had to go to Japan. I don't know if I would have had to pick up the phone and talk to Mr. Toyota. Okay. Let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Secretary. You indicated that you could always 
NHTSA can get outside experts if they need help in an area. Do you know the last time ODI, Office of Defect Investigations, ever hired outside experts to help them with a problem? I do not. Okay. But I'll, I'll put that on the record for you. I, I can find out. Okay. We would appreciate it. Mr. Burgess, question? Yes, Mr. Secretary, just, I'm sure you heard the testimony, the compelling testimony to the Smiths who were here earlier. Of course. The, uh, the uncommanded acceleration in her vehicle. Um, they voiced a lot of frustration over getting anyone at Toyota to, to take them seriously or listen to their problems, but they also voiced some frustration in getting the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to, to listen to them and take them seriously. And I got the impression that they were still waiting for a response from NHTSA. So I, I would appreciate it if you would look into that. We will be in touch with them. I heard the, Mr. Lentz say that uh, he didn't know what had happened to the vehicle, but he was going to make an effort to find it. I would just suggest that maybe NHTSA ought to do, take the same trajectory. Uh, I think you would be very interested to know if some of the things that Professor Gilbert brought up today actually can exist in a real world situation and if that car was the laboratory that created that thank goodness no one died in the experiment but let's get that data and and find out if indeed that's uh, what professor gilbert produced in the laboratory was what mrs smith encountered when she drove her car on the freeway that day well we know where the car is we've talked to the owner of the car and uh, we we hope to be able to uh, uh, explore that Well, that concludes all the questions of um, the members. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. your patience today. We look forward to some follow-up questions you. that we'll be sending you. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming here today. The committee rules provide members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. I ask unanimous consent that four documents, the exponent letter dated February 23, 2010, be entered in record, the report of Professor Michael Petch be entered in record, Mr. Neil Haithman, uh, report be entered in record and Dr. Gilbert's interim report be entered in record. Without objections, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Burgess asked that uh, Governor Perry's letter to the committee uh, be entered in record. Without objection, so be it. That concludes our hearing. This subcommittee, the committee, the meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned.